And so we mentioned uh, last time that to really come to grips with the impact of screw sound, uh, we first need to understand the way screw constructed this kind of sonic ecosphere that, that you're living in when you listen to a screw tape. And we looked at uh, screwing, there's four techniques, remember, screwing, backspinning, chopping, and layering. Screwing and backspinning we looked at a bit last time. And so for now, uh, now we'll look at uh, chopping and layering. And just as a quick reminder of how Screw's turntable setup works when he's utilizing some of these techniques, backspinning is one example uh, of how, or he uses the same setup or the same principle for backspinning as he does for chopping, just chopping is more focused. They're shorter excerpts that he's basically backspinning, but the effect is quite different. So remember that his turntable setup looks like this, where there's one record, I'm calling it record A here, uh, spinning the same exact record as spinning uh, record B, but one record is one beat behind the other, okay, for chopping, right? Uh, and what happens is this fader, the fader just, uh, if it's to the left, we hear record A, if it's to the right, it triggers um, record B. That's what you would hear as an audience member or as a, as a listener. Now, Screw has his headphones on. He can hear how he's able to um, monitor where record two is or record B is at all times. And it's always a beat behind when, he's, when he starts his chopping. So what that means is when he switches that fader over from record A to record B, as record B is uh, one beat ahead. Record A is technically behind, but when you hear, whatever you hear on record A, he'll switch that fader over and you'll hear that repeated. And at this time it's on record B. To you as a listener, you don't know that he's switching records. It just sounds like the same thing is repeated. Now, what that means though, is that there's something being left out. So for beat one, we hear record A. On beat two, we hear record B playing beat one, and then Screw switches back to record A for beat three. So what that means is that whatever was on beat two has been completely deleted from, from our soundscape, right? An easy way to, or an easier way to realize what's going on here is to take something simple like, Let's take Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So here in the left column, I have the original text of Twinkle Twinkle and the right as a sort of imagined chopped text. And I'll explain the red and blue syllables in a second, but just look at the original text here on the left. So there's, if there's two lines, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, how I wonder what you are. Twinkle Twinkle first two lines. If we had that on a record and wanted to chop that text in the same way I just described, it would sound like what you have here in uh, the second column or the, the one on the right. So here's what a chop twinkle twinkle would look like and sound like. Twink, 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 lit, lit, star, star, how, how, one, one, what, what, are, are, Okay, so those red syllables here show you what we don't get in the chop text, the syllables that have been completely replaced by the other syllables. So we don't get twinkle, twinkle, we get twink, twink, twin, twin, <laughs> right? Four twins and no coals, twinkles. Now, why is this important? For a number of reasons, it has this rhythmic effect that is uh, very particular to, to screw, where we keep getting these chops back and forth. It frustrates our kind of expectations of what rhythm is. It also makes the lyrics borderline incomprehensible. If you were to never, if you've never heard the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star song, and you just heard someone singing twin, 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 lit, lit, star, star you would have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> it would be incomprehensible. 
Uh, along with that, the things that get deleted are musical elements that have to do with um, harmony and rhythm and just sort of the coherence of a melody or a song get frustrated. So that's chopping applied to Twinkle Twinkle. Now let's look at it in an actual, uh, what it would look like on a screw tape. Here's Mr. Mike. Uh, this is from a, one of my favorite screw tapes, Blowing Big Behind Tint. It's the very opening track uh, of Blowing Big Behind Tint screw tape. This diagram here may look a little convoluted. I, I promise it looks scarier than it really is. All that I've done here in the, the top row is give you the original version. There's two refrains happening at once in the chorus of this song. Where is your love? That's the top voice. And then in the bottom, Mr. Mike is saying, every now and then I want to ask them where you love at. Okay. Let's just listen to that. So the original chorus of Mr. Mike's Where You Love At. Here it is. <laughs> Okay, so that's the chorus that you see here on the top, the original version. Now the bottom line here is the, is the screw version. And so what happens instead of this long lilting kind of melody, where is your love, right? That gets completely distorted both rhythmically and melodically into where, where is, is your, your love, love, that rhythmic profile. And the same goes for Mr. Mike's every now and then I want to ask them. And now it's just every, every then, then ask, ask, right? And it goes on similarly. So here is the same spot on the, in the screw tape version. Okay, so that's chopping. Uh, and we'll have more to say about all of these. I just kind of want to get you initially acclimated to them. Layering. Uh, layering is, I think, for my ears, the kind of most bewildering part of a, of a screw tape. There's I don't know, there's, there's something going on here that's, that feels different in kind. Uh, when we're talking about that chopping and backspinning, those have a legacy and so does layering that goes back to the early stages of hip hop with Breakbeats, DJ Cool Herc, Flash, Grandmaster Flash, of course. And he's intensifying these techniques in such a way that they're, they're maximalized. Their effect is heightened and more pronounced because of how intensified they are. Now what happens when you combine them all together and then you look at, uh, listen to the layering technique, the intensity is to such a great degree that it doesn't seem to even be a difference in degree anymore, but it's morphed into something tire, entirely different. So instead of a difference in just degree, it's become a difference in kind. And that's gonna be important for a lot of what we deal with the screw. And I'm not saying that isn't the case with the chopping and backspinning and the screwing as well. They're all collectively creating this, this difference that's important. But layering on its own merit uh, is, is something special here. So what screw would do, and so DJs have always taken, have, have layered to a certain degree, usually when they're transitioning between tracks, right? You don't hear a good DJ, uh, even a competent <laughs> DJ, won't play a track and then leave dead air and then start another track. They transition between the two and DJ Screw is no different. Now what's, uh, what is different about Screw's use of layering is that he layers these different tracks for extended periods and then comes out of them and goes back into them for 
many, many minutes at a time, sometimes 10, 12, 14 minutes at a time, he has these tracks layering on top of one another. And what's even uh, more disorienting is that these tracks often seem to have no, um, uh, they don't really link up all that well sonically, both harmonically, melodically, and rhythmically, right? Normally when you're looking for transitions between tracks or for tracks to combine, you're trying to find different ways that they lock in, that they have something in common that makes for that transition, uh, makes for a smoother transition where oftentimes Screw is seemingly trying to find the most uh, grating transition that for this layering to really jump out and, and how uh, distinct the tracks are. So let's look at one example. Uh, let me pull this up for you. Where is it? This is from uh, Chopping Game with Toe. No, that's not it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, here's our layering. So what we'll hear, again, if this doesn't necessarily at all entail that you can read music. That's that's not really, maybe that helps, but I'll explain kind of what's happening here on the diagram. But first let's listen to the original tracks. Here he's layering Tupac's No More Pain with uh, Scarface's Mary Jane. So let's hear these one by one. Here is Tupac's, uh, an excerpt from Tupac's No More Pain. Okay, so a couple things to notice here, and if you, I'll try to point out pretty simply what's happening in the diagram, these little melodic notes, that's the keyboard here. Right, that's just that little uh, piano figure on, on No More Pain. And let's hear the Scarface track, Mary Jane. And here there's more going on, uh, but the point that I want to get across is how these layers uh, combine when he when he combines them. But here's the original Mary Jane. So what's different about this than that Tupac track? You know, pretty much everything, right? Um, there's this, the No More Pain is what we might call more polished. The, I'm sorry, the Mary Jane is more polished. It has different um, interlocking parts. You have a synthesizer, uh, a bass that has this kind of up and down motion, a little bit syncopated. Um, whereas the Tupac is more skeletal, that piano is kind of um, hollow sounding or ghostly sounding, a little bit of reverb, but it's also uh, not very uh, resonant, right? So all of these things will combine and when Screw puts them together here. So here is uh, the all, No More Pain and Mary Jane combined from Chopping Game with Toe. Pretty great, right? Uh, so what do we make of that? And what is, besides just being the kind of novel, something to point out, well, part of what's going on here is that what makes these two so 
dissonant is what's happening is the level of pitch, uh, how he combines these levels of pitch and rhythm. And so Mary Jane has this kind of almost March-like accents on beats one and three. Um, sorry, uh, No More Pain, I'm getting them confused. No More Pain has these one and three accents, whereas Mary Jane, you'll see uh, looking here, on beats two and four, two here. And so that creates a kind of rhythmic discord and rhythmic tension that's heightened. And also on the level of pitch, we're pitting different modes and all modes are, we've talked about modes before, uh, they're just different. It emphasizes different pitches in a scale in different ways. Now, what happens is when you combine multiple modes together, then less things become emphasized and more things become just dissonant and crunchy at the level of pitch. And so we hear that especially uh, in measures four and eight, this note up here uh, in, in No More Pain, um, we have a high C flat against C naturals. That, those aren't meant to go together in these cases. So when layering, screw melds different tracks together and this sonic pile starts forming. There's all these incommensurate melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic layers uh, that pile up in this bewildering, disorienting sensation. And once you kind of give into that, it's a, it's a rather um, fascinating and, and very visceral experience. So for screw, the layering technique is more transformative than transitional. And that's something I want us to pay a lot of attention to for the rest of our discussion about screw and Houston hip hop culture in general, uh, that things are being transformed into their own sense of uh, beingness rather than as sort of transitional or uh, pastiche that we might think. Okay, uh, so that's it for this little mini lesson. Uh, of course, email me with any questions and I will see you all soon. Take care.